This episode of The Candid Frame is brought to you by the Jocko Book Club. Their carefully curated selection reflects the best in contemporary photography and all for a reasonable price. And they are delivered directly to your doorstep each month. They offer free shipping to the US, Canada, and the UK. It's subsidized elsewhere. It's a great way to begin or expand your photo library. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today and remember to use the code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. I love making photographs. I love them because of what I create, but more importantly, for the way photography makes me feel. In such moments, my mind is clear and not concerned with the past or the future. It's just about right now. Photography is, for me, a form of meditation. David Ulrich gets that. He has shared it with others through photography, books, lectures, and workshops. In his latest book, The Mindful Photographer, he goes beyond f-stops and gear. He shares the satisfaction that comes from making a picture and appreciating the moment you're in. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Charcoal Book Club has just opened a you, call for entries for the seventh well, annual the Chico Review. It's a pleasure to, to meet you and have a chance to, to talk with you because from um, looking at your book and uh, checking out your work, I think we're very simpatico in terms of our sensibility, in terms of how we think and approach photography. Um, one of the things that I kind of take away from 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 the book is this idea that Photography uh, is, can, and may, it should be, I don't know, I know if should is the right word, but be considered more selfless and selfish. <laughs> that it's about, you know, that as much as we're creating photography and enjoying the process, that really it's, it's about the opportunity it gives us to share and contribute to others, and I really would like to start that that conversation there, and have you sort of expand on that idea. Well, yes, uh, um, I agree with you completely. Uh, photography is a way of cultivating attention. You know, of course, we're going to be paying attention to ourselves. You know, our thoughts, our feelings, our reactions to what is in front of us. But more importantly, it's a way of interacting with the world. You know, we have so many things going on in the world, some of them positive, some of them very problematic. And I get very tired of uh, what I'm going to call the narcissism of selfies. You know, in Hawaii, we have some extraordinary landscapes. We have a lot of what I'm going to call social issues going on. And what I see when people come here is rather than using their camera, to document and record their surroundings. They're standing in front of a scene and taking a picture of themselves. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm from another generation, but it escapes me about why my appearance is more interesting than the complexity, the exquisite complexity of the world itself. I, I think even before the invention of the smartphone, that people always considered photography, especially when they were traveling, as proof that they were where they said they were, whether it was in Hawaii or Paris. But now with the smartphone, not only can they do it with just themselves, much less their families alongside of them, but now it's it's about sharing it on on social networks, especially like Instagram, and that it's still as much about the self as it is, that it's not necessarily about sharing insight or beauty. It's about look at me and even more so the illusion that I want to create of myself and the life that I lead. That kind of navel, navel gazing is not particularly interesting. The brand called me. Yes. 
You know, Eastman Kodak, when Eastman Kodak sold film, statistically, the, a greater number of pictures were made in Hawaii than any other state. And I think it's perfectly normal when tourists come here and they get excited about the beauty of the ocean and the landscape and even excited about being here and they take a picture of themselves standing in front of the ocean. You know, I was watching a group of uh, teenage girls. I think they were Korean or Japanese. They were having a wonderful time interacting with each other, taking pictures of themselves in front of the ocean. It was very touching. The camera became a way of connecting them to each other. Mm -hmm. But for those of us that live here, and I teach photography here, I probably see 637,000 sunsets per year. Mm -hmm. I probably see 486,000 palm trees. We live in a very interesting and complex environment. It's multi-ethnic, it's multi-racial, it's multi-nationality. It has a host culture with very powerful traditions and mythologies. We have a lot of social issues here. And it boggles my mind that people are not using the powerful tool of the camera to document and record what is taking place here. Filmmakers are doing that, but mm -hmm. not still photographers. So I find it interesting that still photographers seem to be caught up into what I'm going to call the popular photography aesthetic. You know, the word that I hate is high impact images. <laughs> and the camera is a powerful tool for not only self-revealment, you know, in terms of learning how we see the world, but a powerful tool for documenting the concerns, the issues, both environmental and, and social, that impact us all. Yeah, but that's just, you know, the idea that the photographer, whether they're, you know, an amateur or an aspiring professional, that they have that that moment of awareness where they realize that they can do something more than just document what's in front of them and say something. And I think that that is the big challenge for any photographer to get to that point. And even when they come to the realization that they can say something, they go, well, I don't know what the hell I have to say. Yeah. I don't know how I have anything interesting to contribute considering all the other pictures that have been taken before I came into the picture, pun intended. So you work with students, you know, how, how do you help sort of nurture that transition to, to get them away from, you know, taking to making photographs? There's a very beautiful process that goes on. You know, by the second class, I can tell exactly whose photographs are whose, because each of them does have a very unique way of seeing the world. Each of them has very unique sensibilities. They have their own background, their own circumstances. And these things bleed through in the way they see the world. So what I try to do is to point out to them, this is what's unique about your images. But what I'm really saying, this is what is unique about you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. reflected in your images. And after a couple classes, they really begin to, to get that. And they really begin to understand, especially by looking at other people's work, that's very different than their own. They really begin to understand that there is a corner of the world, which is their unique way of seeing. And it's quite extraordinary when they begin to recognize that. It's a very, very empowering experience. A lot of college students have grown up in a, an environment where they don't feel they have a voice. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we live in a large, complex society, and how does a 19-year-old have a voice in that society? And they begin to recognize that the medium photography is a way that they can be true to themselves represent things in the world that are important to them, and over time, you know, interpret those things in the world that are important to them. So it's confusing at, at the beginning. It takes a while for them to grok or for them to get to see something of their unique seeing. 
but it is there. And when they do begin to get it, it's a, it's a, a revelation yeah. and it's an empowering experience. Yeah, I've seen that countless times in my own in my own teaching. And like you said, by the second class, there's something I see. I see the glimmer. You know, if I'm doing my part, and they're willing to sort of embrace it, they get to discover that they have a unique way of seeing. Yes. The, the challenge is being able to tap into that vision consistently. And I, I, I think that one of the difficulties is getting out of one's own way to allow that to come out because there are a lot of stuff that can get caught up with, like not knowing their camera well or or being preoccupied with how other people have photographed a subject matter or worrying about, you know, whether or not it's good enough or they have talent. What do you what do you find works for people to trust the process enough and know that eventually they will be able to achieve that consistently, but that it's going to require some work? How do you how do you how, how do you nurture that? That's a very, very good question. And it's, and it's ongoing. It's a question for me. It's a question for all of us is how do we stay true to ourselves? What I find, first of all, is that people do not take enough pictures. They don't engage the subject deeply enough. So I was a competitive swimmer when I was younger. And before I would swim a race, I had to warm up. I had to loosen up my muscles. I had to get the endorphins flowing. It's no different with photography. I find beginning photographers to be very arrogant. They think they can walk up to a scene, take two pictures, and walk away. You know, a professional photographer knows that they don't know. A professional photographer knows that they get in their own way, that there may be technical challenges, etc. So a professional photographer will engage the subject, spend time, and shoot multiple rolls of film, you know, whether you're photographing digitally or not. They will engage the subject by taking pictures. And there is a process that goes on. When I was teaching photography in the film era, statistically, frame number six was the most successful frame. You know, the, the end of a roll of film because people sketched out their ideas. You know, you have to work through your um, influences. You have to work through imitation. You have to work through to get what you want. And you have to live with the ambiguity that the first 10 or 15 frames are just not necessarily going to be that interesting. But if you engage the subject deeply enough, something powerful and even magical begins to happen. Uh, my girlfriend feels that this is a little bit exploitive, but when I used to shoot film and work with pay paid models, the first two rolls of film, I didn't put film in the camera because most of the time the model was a stranger. I never met them before. And you have to work into a working relationship. And the other thing I would say is that editing is so important. You know, taking a number of pictures but sitting down with your file browser and really studying your images, which ones jump off the page? Which ones do you immediately feel a kinship with that you can say are your own? So it's a combination of work you do in the moment and work you do editing your pictures in your file browser. Does that make sense? It, yeah, it makes sense. And I like the analogy of, that you made when you were swimming competitive, competitively and i think there's a there's a valuable insight to be had there so when you were when you dived into the pool tell me about what you were focused on when you were going down the lengths of the pool that what were the things that you needed to do that, that were necessary for, for you to perform your best well i can tell you because i still do swim every day so the most important thing for me is to stay with it. 90% of the time when I get in the water in the morning, I do not want to be there. <laughs> Usually the water's cold, my muscles are tight. I, I'm just not interested in exercising. But my discipline puts me in the water, and I stay with it, and there's an observable process. If I stay with it, 
after about eight or 10 laps, I get into the flow, the endorphins get released, I'm more focused, my stroke is smoother, I'm more fluid and I'm enjoying being in the water more. So I think the key is to stay with it. You have to fight through initial resistance. And, you know, a, a pianist or a dancer would never consider going on stage without warming up first. Mm -hmm. So that ability to concentrate and that ability to get in what I call the flow is key to any creative or performing art. So you have to do the work. You often have to do the work before you get in the water. If it's a race or when I'm swimming for recreation, I just have to accept that the first eight or 10 laps are what gets me into the flow and I have to stay with the discomfort. Yeah. When, you know, I, when I was thinking about it, even though I, I don't swim, I never have swum competitively, that the idea isn't focusing on winning or worrying about what the person in the next lane is doing, that it's all about trusting all the work that you've put in before in which you've honed your technique, you know, whether you're doing the breath stroke or the, or the back stroke or anything like that, you can't be second guessing what you're doing. You just have to trust that all the time that you've put in, has been worth it but yes but you have to be in the moment you can't be preoccupied with the fact that oh that that last stroke was like a little off you know you have to like you said you have to be incredibly you have to be both so self-aware and enough to to know that a lot of stuff is extraneous and that it's all about the next stroke the next kick and that's all it's about. And for me, that's really what exists in photography. It's like about, it's about the very moment that I'm seeing right there. It's not about whether or not it's going to be a good picture or not, or the next possible subject. It's about being present in that moment and giving it all I can. And as you said, you know, you usually don't get there from just taking one photograph. It's, it's embracing the process of seeing and refining that seeing that help leads you to being able to create an image that's personal rather than just a snapshot. A absolutely. And, and yes, that's why at the very beginning of our talk, I said photography is about cultivating attention. We need to be attentive to this moment. And let's face it, you know, we, we are distracted people. I am distracted much of the time. So the cultivation of attention means that you are simply aware of what is going on. And if I'm out taking a picture and I'm struggling to be present to the moment, you know, I see this mental process going on. Oh, I want this to be a good picture. Oh, I want people to like it. Oh, you know, am I using the right f-stop? We can't avoid what Buddhists call the monkey mind, what we all know of as the mind that is constantly talking. So since we can't avoid it, we have to let it be. We have to get behind it. We have to be able to observe how am I in this moment and what is going on in this moment. And the more that we can just allow these other kinds of thoughts to pass mm -hmm. rather than focusing on them, that is, I think, key to being present in the moment. The strongest pictures I make are when I'm not thinking about taking the picture, when I'm really present to the process. And there is a kind of um, flow that one can experience. I'm, I'm publishing a book um, coming out in November on the Oceana Dunes on the California coast. And I had a really interesting experience. <clears throat> I, I will go out for two or three hours at a time and I can see my process. I can see when I'm getting more present in the moment, that is when I'm getting warmer. 
and I can see when I'm getting tired and distracted, and I can see a process from beginning to take pictures on a given day as the day progresses. And what I discovered when I went back and looked at my file browsers, the strongest pictures were made each day in about a 15 minute window when all of my work of cultivating attention, of trying to be present, paid off. But I am not a Buddhist monk. It's difficult to maintain that kind of attention and that kind of presence. Mm -hmm. I can maintain it for periods of time. And I really see the direct result of my presence in the pictures I make. But then, you know, I get hungry or <clears throat> I get, oh my God, you know, it, 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 it's so much weight walking up and down these dunes. All kinds of other thoughts and feelings intrude. So I think it's a constant dynamic. I don't know about you, but I am not naturally present without doing some work or without making some effort. You know, I don't just wake up on the right side of the bread, bed and feel focused all day. You know, I need to remember, um, I was watching a TV show on Navy SEALs and the team leader kept saying to his sailors, focus up, focus up. Mm. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's such a good metaphor. I need to focus up when I'm teaching, when I'm taking pictures, when I'm being interviewed. You know, there's certain times in my life when I really do want to be present and to, if you will, focus up. One of the things that is is sort of another challenge is because we live in a world in which we live with more photographs that have ever been taken, an impression has been made in our minds as to what something looks like, whether it's Slot Canyon, whether it's Notre Dame, whether it is... Kilauea. And the tendency or the inclination is to create the picture that we saw before, to recreate it using our own own cameras. And you see that a lot in, in landscape photography, especially at like arches, for example, where all these photographers cluster up at the edge of this very small arch, wait for the sun to come up and, and there to take their version of that of that picture, which is all well and good. You know, I'm not saying that, that that's bad, but I think it's there's a moment where the photographer wants to say something more, say something that you, unique. But I know when I come onto a scene that has been, you know, photographed often, that it takes a little bit for me to get past that vision that I've already have in my brain and to be able to see it in that unique way. For me, I'll take that picture anyway, even though I know it's not mine. I'll take it just because I need to get it out of my system. And then I'll start trying to figure out what speaks to me uniquely, what's really resonating with me. And I find that that's the only way for, for me to get there. Is that similar for you? I think that is a universal experience. I was a Boy Scout when I was 13 or 14 years old, and I, I took a photography merit badge class. And the first thing that my, the first photography teacher I ever had said to me, said, now that you've taken the picture you set out to make, now is the time to start exploring. Mm. So yes, I do the same thing. We all have to work through our influences. You know, we've seen the slot canyons. We've seen Arches National Park. We know the standard pictures. And we're going to make them. But the, the, the key is not to stop there. So, you know, once you've made that, that iconic picture that you know you want in your portfolio, now is the time to start really exploring the scene and asking the question, what is my relationship to the scene? I have one student who's not a landscape photographer, but she goes to these iconic scenes and her interest is photographing the way people interact with these iconic scenes. 
So she's finding her own relationship to it. I know somebody else who will really try to find the places that resonate with him rather than the places, you know, that are on the, the, the photographic hit list that everybody goes to. So how did, for example, how did Paul Caponegro discover Stonehenge? Mm -hmm. You know, he's finding places that resonate with him. How did I discover Hawaii? Um, I discovered Hawaii because I became interested in the volcano. And, you know, I found a very deep resonance with the transformation, the death and rebirth that takes place in this environment on a weekly and monthly basis. So the, the, the key word for me is resonance. Where do you and I, where do each of us find our resonance? And we're different as people. Some people gravitate to the city. Some people gravitate toward portraits or photographs of people. Other people gravitate to the land or particular places. But I think we have to open the question up. What resonates with me? D.H. Lawrence wrote a marvelous essay called The Spirit of Place. Every place has its own personality, its own spirit, if you will. And it is an, it's observable how, different, how we respond to different places. I find a very different response when I'm in a shopping mall compared to when I'm in the ocean. And there's particular places in this world that for unknown reasons that I resonate with. And I'm sensitive to that. I think all photographers need to be sensitive to where do they resonate and with what kind of subject matter. For me, the way I interpret that is, is for myself, is, is when I'm in that space, I'm more concerned initially with what the moment feels like rather than what it looks like. And then when I have that feeling, yeah. even though the picture may not be obvious to me, I, I, I've come to trust the feeling. So I stop. And then the process is, okay, making a series of choices so that I can sort of chisel away, you know, the stone that doesn't need to be there until what's meant to be there is revealed to me. You, you know, you photograph landscapes yeah and there you know you have a you can go to a location but you can turn left you can go turn right you I mean there's any anywhere that you, you you can go tell me about those moments or if you can give me a, a good example of when that process did happen for you and you made a discovery that led to a photograph that you felt really reflected your your experience of that of that place well, I want to step back to something you said, and that is that uh, it's something we don't remember often enough, that feelings are a way of knowing, and feelings are a way of responding to the world. You know, we are, we are tripart. We have a mind, we have a body, and we have feelings. Our mind, our senses, and our feelings are all engaged when we're looking at things and looking at things to photograph. So we have to be sensitive to the body and the feelings. The body and the senses, as well as the feelings, have a wisdom that extends beyond the rational mind. What I often find when I'm out taking pictures is I have a strong sense of intuition. Out of nowhere, I, I have a sense or a feeling I need to go over this way. Or, you know, I look in, in this direction and I see something and it just doesn't feel right, so I don't walk in that direction. But I see something over in this direction that feels right, and so I intuitively walk in that direction. When I find an image that I resonate with, it's unmistakable. My heart beats faster. I have a certain amount of awe I'm kind of enthralled with the subject. And the painter, Kandinsky, said, most great art comes from inner necessity. 
So I am much more interested in those pictures that I take that I know I have to take, that I must take, compared to those ones where I'm arguing with myself, oh, should I spend time? Should I take this picture? If there's an argument going on, usually the picture is not interesting. But if there's an immediate, unhesitating yes, what I would call an inner necessity, that has been the source of many of my strongest images. And those moments are not recognized with the rational brain. No. Those moments are recognized through my senses and through my feelings. And that's why practice and shooting often is so important. Because it's not so much the accumulation of the photographs. It's about it is is about developing familiarity with that feeling and knowing that you can trust it even when the circumstances don't seem to be conducive to photography. Like the other day I had to go I had to go photograph and make some images. I wasn't feeling it. I got out of the car and I was just I wasn't in the ideal place. I was not centered the way I usually am. But I knew that okay, I just need to walk and just explore. And one of the things that helped me is that I went off the beaten path. I went to places that I normally wouldn't go just because I knew that they would be unfamiliar from, from, from unfamiliar. And even though I part of me felt like eh, I probably won't find anything there, I said, go there anyway. And I ended up making those discoveries where I saw something, I felt something, and that excitement came up. And then it was, oh, wow, that that's what practice gives you is is not so much in learning the mechanics of the camera, which certainly is important, but the sense of self-awareness that you need in order to be able to be the photographer that only you can be. I mean, the title of your book is The Mindful right. Photographer, and I think that that's really essential for any artist, whether the photographer or not, is a, a sense of self-awareness, of knowing what works, what doesn't work, in terms of getting yourself into, into that space. Yes. And I have two things to say about that. First of all, I think as photographers, we're a little bit greedy, you know, we always want to come home with a strong picture. But I have found this repeatedly. Sometimes we need to sketch out ideas. Sometimes we need to explore something with a camera. So I make a distinction. Very often when I go out and I don't come back with anything outstanding, I still think the process is worthwhile. I've sketched out a number of ideas and those ideas might come to fruition later. The beautiful thing about the creative process is we do both. You know, we sketch out ideas and we find finished, finished pictures, if you will. But we can't assume that we're going to get to a strong articulated, a strongly articulated image without doing our sketching first. That's number one. Number two, I think that our bodies are reliable instruments of discovery. When I'm looking at something and I put a frame around it, an eighth of an inch this way or this way or up or down or a slight difference in my point of view, all of a sudden something comes alive. I think that creativity and sexuality are closely tied. When I'm exploring a subject and I'm really trying to be present in my body, in my feelings, when I find the right configuration, the right moment, the right frame, I often feel a slight sexual charge, you know, a charge of generative energy. Mm -hmm. And we have a discernment mechanism. Our senses, our feelings can discern when the moment is right, when the frame is right. But we need to be paying 
equal attention to our inner being while we're looking outward because our responses to the world do not take place out there. They take place mm -hmm. in here. So it's, Cartier Bresson said, a powerful picture is made when one eye is turned outward and one eye is turned inward and the two images converge. And I think that's a really good metaphor because mindfulness means being aware of the moment. Many people think of mindfulness, oh, I'm only aware of my tension or my heartbeat or my breathing, but we're also aware of our thoughts and feelings. And in a true mindful practice, we're equally aware of ourselves and what's around us. Charcoal Book Club has just opened a call for entries for the 7th Annual Chico Review and Publishing Prize. 2023 speakers include Antoine Diagata, Stacey Kranitz, Curran Hadelberg, and Anastasia Samazlova. If you aren't familiar, the Chico Review is a juried photo book retreat over six nights in Chico Hot Springs Resort near Livingston, Montana. 64 photographers are selected by a jury and are invited to spend the week taking part in portfolio reviews, artist lectures, panel discussions, workshops, and communing over drinks in the saloon and hot springs, and so much more. At the conclusion of the event, one grand prize winner will be awarded the Charcoal Publishing Prize and have a book published and distributed worldwide by the Charcoal Book Club. The application deadline is November 27th. Apply now at ChicoReview.com. Now, you know, we're talking mostly about the creation of the image. But as you alluded to earlier, the editing is, is just as important, if not more so. How do these, this sort of intuitiveness, this feeling, how does that translate or how can photographers translate this practice, this, this sensibility to when they're sitting in front of the computer, looking at hundreds of pictures on the screen, trying to discern which picture is the picture. And because I think that's one of the hardest, the hardest thing for any photographer to, to learn. But I think there's something to utilizing that same sensibility that you practice when making pictures to the editing process. But for you, how do you, how do you find what, you know, what steps do you do to, in order to make that work? First of all, I was very lucky having grown up in the film era and in teaching during the film era, we would look at student contact sheets. Contact sheets are where the energy was because you would see their whole process. And what I learned in looking at contact sheets is some pictures jump off the page. The word that I would use is the pictures have unity and coherence. You look at, let's say, 20 or 30 pictures of a photographer's engagement with the subject, two or three of those pictures are going to have unity and coherence. The picture is going to come together in a way that works. And what I do when I'm looking at contact sheets or file browsers is I don't do this. I don't go in and scrutinize each one. I stand back and I look at all the pictures and I ask the question, which ones have unity? Which ones have coherence? which ones shine a little brighter on the page. And again, it's my mind gets in the way because my mind will say, oh, you know, the right picture of this should contain this something in the frame. But if I allow my senses to operate in my instincts, it's almost an infallible guide to which pictures have unity and coherence. Do you know who Alan Arkin, the actor, is? Oh, yeah. Wonderful actor. Great comedic mm -hmm. actor. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, he teaches workshops in improvisation. 
and not just to actors, to everybody, because learning how to improvise, he feels, is important in your lives. And when he's teaching an improvisation workshop, he said, I, he said, I use my butt theory. My butt knows. He said, if I'm watching somebody improvise and they're being clever and very good, he said, I sit back and I take it in and I appreciate it. He said, but if somebody's really bringing energy and creativity to the scene, my butt automatically moves forward. Mm. When my butt moves forward, he said, something is going on. And I use Alan Arkin's butt theory when I'm looking at pictures on the file browser. When the pictures are interesting and good, I'm sitting back. But when something happens, I go like this and I move in. Bam. There's unity and coherence in that picture. Yeah. I, and, they, and, and in that space, you can find the surprises. I was looking at some work of a photographer who I'm mentoring. He had one picture that he had of, he photographed some people, and he was in Hawaii, and he was photographing some people who were surfing, and he had this one picture of a dog who was like sitting there on a blanket, looking out into the ocean, observing his, his owner, you know, frolic in the water. And the light on the dog was wonderful, and he thought it was really a, really a wonderful moment. And then I looked at the photograph, and I said, oh, what I really love is the, uh, the artificial legs that are buried in the sand behind the dog and how the lead is attached to it. And he hadn't seen it when he made the picture. It was only when I pointed it out that he, he realized that that was in the photograph. And... That has happened to me so many times. No, not so much with artificial legs in my photographs, but those things that I didn't see in the moment, but that I feel that part of me did, because that's why it's in the composition, that it's not just about just luck, because it's happened enough that I know that it is, is, it's because I'm trusting trusting myself, even though I may not be completely con conscious, as I sometimes think I am, when I'm making a, a, a photograph. But what's so interesting about that, you're, I agree with you completely. It's hard to fathom the truth of science, that 95% of our mind is unconscious. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we're living in this little sliver, little sliver of the 5% of our mind that is rational and conscious. But I think you're absolutely right. When we're photographing, our unconscious are taking things in. It's taking things in. It's seeing things that we're not, we're not consciously aware of in the moment. So I find that a really interesting part of the creative process, that our unconscious will teach us about elements of ourselves that have not yet reached conscious awareness. And we see that all the time with stuff that is present in our pictures that, as you said, some part of you must have known it was there, but you weren't consciously aware of it. I think that if, if one studies one's own pictures, you're going to find what Minor White used to call core forms, core shapes and forms that we use repeatedly with different subject matter, you know, color or tonal relationships that we use repeatedly, and certain kinds of subjects that we are un attracted to without quite knowing why. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's not, yeah, well, yeah, you get it. Yeah, and I think that th th that's one thing. I like. I'm sure that you hear a lot. Young photographers are always obsessed with how do they, de they develop their style, and my answer is simply just keep shooting. It will reveal itself. Because I look at my photographs, and my brother, who is not a photographer, I think about a year ago, says, "You know, when I'm on Instagram, I know they're the, your pictures even before I see your name." And I, I was really touched and moved to hear my brother 
say that. And I wouldn't necessarily say that I have a style because I'm kind of all over the place in terms of subject matter. But I knew what he was saying was true because he was commenting more on the way I see than what I photograph. And Yeah, it's a common problem. People say, oh, I don't have a style. Or my students often say, oh, I don't know what my color sense is. I say, you know, just go open your closet. That'll tell you what your color (laughs) sense is. (laughs) You know? I often have people go up and stand next to their pictures. And it's remarkable. People often look like their pictures. I I look at where I wear. I wear black. I'm a black and white photographer. Mm -hmm. I often wear black or white or gray. But there is that sense of style that lies underneath the subject matter that has to do with, you know, the way you handle shape and form, the, the subtle tonal and color relationships in a picture. And those things are absolutely a signature. So I'm impressed with your brother because your brother, I I don't think, he must not be a photographer, but he's able to witness and observe something in your work that makes it your own. Mm -hmm. And I see that in my work and I see that in the work of my students. How do you dress? How do you move? How do you speak? You know, all of these things represent your style and you can probably find links between all of these parts of us and how we take pictures. That's, that's something I'm going to have to write about, <laughs> you know, in, in, cause, cause that's a really interesting, interesting question that I haven't really thought about, but I am sure that the way that I navigate life, um, probably is going to be very analogous to, the picture taking process. Yes. You just you just mentioned Minor White who you had the opportunity to you know to to study with. What what were some of the things that you value most about your time with him? What I value the most about my time with him was his own wisdom and his own personal characteristics. People talk about in art history, people talk about the male gaze you know, that, mm-hmm. that often men photograph women in a way that's exploitive or is objectifying to women. But what I experienced with Minor White was a different quality of a male gaze. The first time I met him, I felt that he was really seeing me. And he was looking at me in a way that literally would see right through me. But it wasn't the least bit uncomfortable. And then I recognized in that moment that what was present in his gaze was a sense of impersonal love. Hmm. You know, not not love for me exactly, but but love for humanity. I had the same experience meeting Paul Strand, that in his gaze was presence and a sense of impersonal love. So Minor White could see He could see people, he could see the world. It always struck me when I would go photographing with Minor, I would be out and I would take a bunch of pictures and I would try this and I would try that. And Minor in his great presence would just look around and then go directly to something and take one picture. That was it. (laughs) (laughs) So I felt that he was present And I felt that he could see. And that impressed me profoundly. That ability to be fully present in a moment was something that he embodied and something that I wanted. When you say that, I think that for me, it sounds like a lack of judgment, a lack of judgment of saying this is good or this is bad or this is worthy, or this is worthless. It's about seeing and experiencing whatever it is as it is with a, with a high sort of a degree of acceptance. Because I know in, in my early years as a photographer, I would look at a scene, and even though I was reacting to it, like we talked about earlier about that feeling, 
I would make a judgment about it after, say, taking one picture and go, oh, it's crap, and move on. And I think that judgment really uh, hampered me from developing in the way that I eventually did. And I think that that's what yeah. you're speaking of when you, when, you, when you mention those two photographers in terms of how they saw you, that they let go of, of that judgment and, and compartmentalizing the things that they were seeing. Right. And, you know, I think that judgment is often a dirty word. But what I observed from Minor White is he really did attempt to see what is. And he left his conclusions open. He didn't come to conclusions right away. But clearly, if you observe something or someone over time, you do render judgments. But those judgments are informed judgments. They're not knee-jerk judgments. So he would criticize me and my work in very appropriate ways because he kept a question open and explored it before he came to an immediate conclusion. I tell my students, I do not like green people from Mars. When I see green people from Mars, you know, I, I, I see that I have a bias, I have a bias. So if a green person from Mars walks into my class, I have to work much harder to stay open and receptive. So part of being mindful is seeing our own preferences, our own likes and our own dislikes, our own biases, and holding those things in abeyance as we learn about the subject. I did a project in Hong Kong with children, middle school children and photography. And a Chinese lady walked up to me and she said, are you an American? And there was a certain amount of accusation in her voice. <laughs> so I said very nervously, yes, I'm an American. And she looked him in the eye and she said, <clears throat> you know what I find so interesting about you Americans? She said, you believe in your own opinions. And then she said something that floored me. She said, how can you learn something new if you only believe in your own opinions? Mm. I thought, wow, it's true. Yeah. Americans do that. We do believe in our own opinions. You know, we're, we're blue state, we're red state, whatever. But what would it mean to put my opinions in abeyance, not to give them up, put them aside as I continue to learn about something or somebody? Or ourselves. Or ourselves. Or, yeah. yes, well said, or ourselves, yes, absolutely. You, t you talk about the certain s steps that you follow in your, in your practice. I think there's like seven steps. I mean, it might be the right word, but can you go over them briefly to, to share about your practice? Well, now you're talking about, I I'm going to answer that question in terms of mindful practice okay. as opposed to just photographic practice. One of the things I find very important is I don't like this word, but what I would call meditating, sitting quietly, you know, observing one's thoughts and feelings and bodily sensations. So I try to sit for 15 minutes or so every day. And I find that that really is a grounding mechanism. It's a grounding mechanism for how I live my life. And it's a grounding mechanism for when I go out and take pictures. The second part of my practice, when I am out in the world, whether I'm teaching or taking pictures, is being aware of my body. So often when I'm photographing, I'll pay attention to my feet on the ground or, you know, my hands on the camera. I find having some awareness of the sensations of my body is also a grounding mechanism helps me be more present in the moment. And then third, what I was saying before, I am like most people, I'm distracted, and I'm full of my own opinions and biases. I really try to live life as a question. When I interact with a student, I try to interact with them as a question, 
rather than as if I know who they are. If I'm interacting with a subject behind a camera, I try to interact from a frame of no mind, trying to stay open and receptive to how the subject might unfold. And then finally, um, I believe that a certain rigor is required from the mind. I do think that we have a responsibility as photographers to express how we see the world. And as you said earlier, it's important to know when we're digesting other people's images and when we're finding something that we could call our own. So we need to critically examine our own work. And with teaching, I need to critically examine myself in the moment. Am I really serving the needs of the student when I'm taking pictures? Am I really commenting on the world in a way that is true to who I am? So children are marvelously creative. Everything I'm saying about being in touch with the body and the feelings, children manifest without even trying. But what children don't have, children do not have the rigor of the adult mind. Mm -hmm. You and I have a much greater capacity to analyze and evaluate. And I think that that mental rigor is really important. A lot of my students don't have that rigor. You know, they, they still photograph from what I'm going to say all over themselves. In one moment, they'll make something deep and profound. And the next moment, they'll make something, you know, a cliche. So mm -hmm. what role does the body, the mind, and the feelings play in the creative process? I think each of these entities within us plays a unique role. But the rigor of the mind, I think, is really important for evaluating and analyzing our own actions and our own images. You know, you know we, we talked about photographs in service of others and in terms of our world and, and saying something with them. But what do you think are some of the, the considerations people should make when they are deciding to share the work, whether it's a post on Instagram or creating a zine or creating a small exhibition of their work. If the goal is to contribute something to the greater good, what do you think, how do you think people should think of themselves and their work when they're making those choices? I don't really know the answer to that because everyone is different and everyone's criteria would be different, but you know, I, I interviewed Matthew Ricard, the, the Buddhist monk. He was an aide to the Dalai Lama. He's considered the happiest man alive. Mm -hmm. They attached electrodes to his brain, and, you know, he's chill, if you will. And he said something that floored me. He said, most of the time for creativity, the artist is saying, look at me, look at me. And I agree with that. He then said, there are moments in life where we experience insight, where we experience luminosity, where we experience our natural wisdom. And those are the moments we should be expressing. So I think regrettably, and this comes back to the very beginning of our conversation, many people are engaged in art and photography because they want to say, look at me, Look at what I've produced. Mm -hmm. I have some um, photography students that are well off, that are middle class or upper middle class, and they love to bring in souvenirs, pictures that are souvenirs from their trips. And I often feel that's a way of saying, look at me. So I would say there's a Hawaiian word named kuleana. <clears throat> what is my privilege, my honor, my duty, and my responsibility, my own place of genius. What is that place for you? Where is your place of genius where you can see the world and bring into the world something that only you can? 
That's the question we should all be facing as artists. And those are the pictures we should be putting out into the world. Man. I am moved by a lot of my students when they make pictures that clearly represent how they see the world. And that authenticity touches something in me and presumably in the audience as well. So if we use the key word of authenticity as a guide for what we put into the world, I think that it would be wonderful. Yeah, and I've, I've witnessed that countless times in, in the classroom, whether it's in person or virtual. And I know that moment has happened, not when someone in the class says, oh, that's a good picture, but it's when they vocalize their reaction. They go, ooh, ah, that's the moment you're talking about. I tell my students to watch the nonverbals because when somebody says, oh, oh, you know, they make those noises. <laughs> mm -hmm. Something's going on with the picture, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know you're onto something. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to explore on their own. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Oh, boy. Well, I think if you were going to interview somebody and have a really fascinating conversation, you should see if you can interview Stephen Shore. Mm -hmm. But he might be beyond the scope of doing something like this. Another person I find really thoughtful and interesting in their work is Todd Hido, H-I-D-O. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm reading a lot of Stephen Shore these days because I'm really impressed with the way he experiments with attention with his own work. And Todd Hito, I'm really interested in not only his sensibilities, but his willingness to talk about things that are difficult that affect us all. His book, Bright Black World, in that book, he said, I want to photograph the darkness I see coming. And he was talking about climate change. Yeah, with, with both of them, I have, uh, I've, especially with Stephen, I have reached out and have yet to land him. But uh, uh, <laughs> at some point, I'm, I'm, I, I remain hopeful. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for your time. It was real fun. You're very welcome. It, it, great conversation. Uh, I love your questions. You're obviously thoughtful and insightful, and thank you for your insights. If you enjoy the content that we have produced over the years, we can always do with your financial support. We make every episode available for free. We've chosen not to restrict episodes behind a paywall or paid subscriptions. You can ensure that it stays that way by supporting the Candid Frame financially by becoming a Patreon supporter. Thousands of people listen to this show, but only a handful support us financially. You can help change that by becoming a Patreon supporter today. You can contribute five, ten, twenty dollars or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. If you've been thinking about it, why not choose to do it today? Thank you so much for your continued support. Thanks to David for joining us. Find out more about him and his work by visiting creativeguide.com. If you're a fan of our work, you can write reviews on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts and share a favorite episode on social networks, be it Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Remember to use the hashtag TheCandidFrame. If you're a fan of our work, you can write reviews on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts and share a favorite episode on social networks, be it Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Remember to use the hashtag TheCandidFrame. You can also support us financially by contributing via PayPal or Patreon. Thanks to M. Ballinger from the U.S. and Dr. Strangeman from Canada for their five-star reviews. And if you can't find every episode on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. 
No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frames audio engineer is Martin Taylor. You can find at the theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarinex, and this is The Candid Frame.